Hello, and welcome to the Publishing Executive and Book Business Webinar, Digital Equality, the Importance of Accessibility in Your Publishing Strategy, sponsored by Senveo Publisher Services. My name is Matt Steinmetz. I'm Publisher and Brand Director of Publishing Executive and Book Business, and I'll be your host uh, for the next hour. Before we get started, let me take a second to point out the Tips for Attendees widget that you should see in your console. It's the blue icon. It has a wrench on it. Um, if you missed the tech tip video that we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click this widget for more information um, or if you, have any, if you have any troubleshooting issues. I also want to remind everyone, we'll be taking questions toward the end of the webinar, but you can submit your questions anytime over the next hour through the Q&A box. Um, no one else will see them except the speakers, so feel free to, to answer questions as they come to mind, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can uh, toward, the, toward the end of the event. So let's move on to uh, today's program. Um, compelled by clear ethical reasons and compliance requirements, most publishers are already working to make content fully accessible. Creating content that is born accessible also opens up new opportunities for publishers to expand the reach of content and connect with new audiences and markets. The same technologies and guidelines that improve access to materials for people with visual, hearing, mobility, perceptual, and cognitive limitations or who face other barriers to reading printed materials can also be tremendously useful to, to all customers. So in this webinar, we'll discuss how verified accessible content drives positive social change through technology and makes good business sense for publishers. I'm happy to, happy to say that, that we have three fantastic speakers today. Um, first, we have Rohan Kohli, Head of Learning, Design, and Accessibility for Senveo Publisher Services. Next up, we'll have Anna Selden, Associate Director of Publications for Georgetown Law. Uh, and our third and final speaker will be Rachel, Rachel Comerford, uh, Director of Content Standards at Macmillan Learning. So I want to thank uh, Rohan, Anna, and Rachel for being here today and sharing their expertise with us. Um, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Rohan Kohli has more than 14 years of experience designing learning and designing for accessibility in learning in the education and corporate learning domains. Rohan's experience spans a wide range of learning formats, including micro-learning, business and educational simulations, game-based learning, and story-based learning design. Writing, design, and technology are Rohan's key interest areas. So Rohan, Rohan I'd like to welcome you to uh, the webinar and hand the presentation over to you at this point. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Matt. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon, good evening, as the case might be. Uh, my name is Rohan Kohli, and I am the head of learning design and accessibility at uh, Sanveo Publisher Services. Sanveo is an industry-leading provider of editorial content and technology services to education publishers, journal publishers, and other content-centric organizations. I lead teams that are responsible for ensuring our learning products, well, both digital and print, are instructionally effective and available for consumption to learners with all different abilities. Today I'm going to be talking about what it means to make publications accessible, print or digital, uh, why it is important, why, uh, what maturity level the idea of accessibility is at across markets, and where it is headed. Okay, but first, I mean, you know, what, what is accessibility? Let's, uh, let's start with that. Um, accessibility is the degree to which products, devices, um, services, and environments are usable by people with disabilities or additional needs. A product or service is truly accessible when it can be used both unassisted or with the help of uh, assistive technologies such as screen readers. The key benefits publishers realize by making content accessible are philanthropic, regulatory, and promotional in nature. Accessible content uh, automatically reaches more people, which is great for the business from a CSR standpoint, as well as in the commercial sense. Improved discoverability of content is a happy fallout of accessible publications. And this means that the availability of features such as uh, semantic structuring, alternate text tags, closed captions, etc., uh, simultaneously make content accessible and aid in its discoverability. Of course, 
content that is born accessible is also a federal mandate and baking in accessible design into production workflows is a way of ensuring that the business is uh, legally compliant. We'll continue to dive deeper into the benefits uh, throughout this webinar as well. Okay, so what does accessibility for digital books look like? A, a few characteristics are setting a defined reading order for the content, maintaining color contrast ratios between the background and the foreground. It means having meaningful alternate text descriptions or the uh, alt tags for images and for complex math or any non-image, uh, uh, sorry, non-text items and closed captions for videos and animations. Please bear in mind that this is only a small universe of features that help us enable accessibility in the books world. I'm hoping to give you a wider view into features that support accessibility in digital publications in the next few slides. In addition to the items discussed on the previous slide, education publishers in the US have the additional task of creating NIMAS file sets for delivery to the federally um, mandated repository, the National Instructional Materials Access Center, or NIMAC. The NIMAS file set involves uh, semantic structuring of content, defined reading order, and alternate text descriptions for images or non-text items. This file set is used to create specialized formats such as audiobooks, braille, and digital text. Moving to journals, well, the, the online version of journal articles shares uh, many accessibility features with uh, digital books, including some, a few things that you've heard, semantic structuring, uh, defined reading order, metadata, navigable content, tag tables, etc. Print versions of articles can come with accompanying accessible PDFs, although you know, in our case, only those customers in healthcare have ever asked us to create uh, uh, accessible PDFs. In addition to the uh, accessible accessibility features for digital books and journals, the PDF versions can have enhanced forms. They can have, uh, well, they should have expanded the uh, acronyms and abbreviations at every instance and, uh, and embedded fonts. Let's turn our attention to uh, learning videos now. Uh, this, this is a format whose popularity as uh, learning resources, it's just exploded in, uh, you know, a few years back. And uh, it is still holding, you know, that pattern is still holding. Um, learning videos pose a singular and significant challenge. They are so visual. So at first glance, it may look like uh, learners with visual impairments are at a clear disadvantage. With accessibility features, however, um, the endeavor is to bring the learning experience, if not the viewing experience of a video or animation, as close to those folks that do not have visual impairments. Uh, these features are voiceover transcripts, audio descriptions that announce uh, scene changes and transitions, and closed captions, uh, among others. Games. Uh, now, games are also a very, very popular learning format, especially in the, in the K through 12 space. These are highly interactive products that rely on the richness of uh, visuals, gameplay, um, timed elements, and, and so on. So, you know, again, obviously in, inherently uh, ex in, inaccessible, pretty much. Um, th there are features, however, that help uh, enhance accessibility of learning games while keeping the game play quotient high. Uh, so, for example, having a settings panel with separate controls for uh, volume, um, for speech, for sound effects, and the background score, that's always a good practice. This, this panel should also include the ability to change font sizes and color and slow down any timers or uh, in fact, totally eliminate them. Designing context-sensitive help instructions is also recommended. Game states should also be read out by screen readers. Uh, 
For example, if performance feedback is being displayed, uh, the screen reader should clearly state, um, state that. Uh, of course, any essential game information should have text equivalents in addition to color and audio cues. All interactive elements such, uh, should be large, they should be well spaced, and they should be accessible by keyboard controls as well. Okay, websites. Now, the, the, that's the big one. They are everywhere, right? Like literally. And, and that's, that's the reason why if, uh, if there was only one kind of publication that could be made accessible, websites uh, would be that. Again, um, accessible websites share a number of characteristics with accessible books and journals, uh, a few, few of those that you've seen so far. Um, and, and some of the unique ones here include uh, easily identifiable um, interactive elements, redundant ways to communicate information, not color alone, um, skip navigation scheme, image and uh, media alternatives in accessible versions, and compatibility for different viewport sizes. Okay, let us now look at challenges uh, facing accessibility in publishing. It is true that design for accessibility has come a long way since uh, publishers and governments started to think about universal access seriously, but challenges uh, persist. Uh, the conceptualization and design of published materials is still largely focused on users with no impairment because implementing accessibility features can, uh, it, it can be an expensive affair um, sometimes. Also, I mean, the, you know, technology support for born accessible formats can often be inadequate. Uh, published materials are not fully compliant with accessibility requirements and workarounds are needed after the fact for compliance um, requirements. You know, PDFs generated from uh, InDesign are, are an example of this. Performance of assistive technologies also varies from one supplier to another. And uh, then, of course, um, uh, alternate text description writing is, is an art as much as it is a science. And it re relies heavily on the individual writing those um, text descriptions, uh, and it depends on um, you, you know, their grasp of what is needed to fully convey the information to persons with disabilities. Okay, so while challenges exist in creating an accessible world, there, there's, a, there's a lot of com comfort to be had in, in how technology is aiding universal access in environments around us. So many museums are incorporating tactile exhibits in their repertoire, uh, updated audio guides and apps that integrate large text formats and beacon-like technology. San Francisco Airport is, is a case in point. It's, it's one of the first to test uh, beacons to help passengers with visual impairments to navigate the large space. The beacons connect to a smartphone app and announce uh, locations and directions. Also, voice recognition is now pretty much uh, mainstream thanks to Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple. Uh, visually impaired users of smartphones are among the heaviest users of services like Alexa, Cortana, and uh, Siri. And universities such as Stanford and uh, Carnegie Mellon are including accessibility and universal design into their curricula for computer science and design courses. So all in all, there is hope yet. So it's challenging to generalize where different publishers are in terms of true accessible accessibility compliance. It really depends on the individual publisher and their business requirements. There is always room for improvement. And in fact, at Synveo Publisher Services, we are currently conducting a content audit of our accessibility compliance across marketing materials and our website. We don't see compliance as a race for the prize, but an ongoing process of evaluation and strategic improvements. Where, where does it make sense for your content to implement accessibility? Do you draw a line in the sand and say from 2018 forward, all content is born accessible? 
how, how do you evaluate legacy content? Uh, you know, these, these are tough questions that require input from a variety of stakeholders in an organization. We've been working on creating NIMAS uh, file sets for years with uh, our K-12 through and education publishers. Uh, because of U.S. federal mandates such as NIMAS, there are clear drivers to produce accessible content. When it comes to professional publishers, it really depends on the type of content and where that content is being used. In some cases, professional publishers are starting to sell into the K-12 through market and we suspect we will see more requests to support an accessible publishing strategy for those types of publishers. Journal publishers have been producing XML content for decades. By default, that means uh, there is inherent structure in the content produced. Structure, um, logical reading order, all text, the markup, uh, the, this is all in the content, but to the degree that it is fully accessible, simply depends on the publisher and the workflows uh, employed. Government and healthcare organizations, uh, they, they've made accessibility a huge priority. We've been producing Section 508 PDFs for, uh, for a major insurance provider for four years, and, and each year that business grows. So I guess that's uh, that's it from me uh, this morning. Matt, would you like to take this away then? Sure, Rohan. Thank you very much. I think that was a terrific uh, table setter for the rest of, of the hour. Uh, appreciate the, the overview where you were able to provide. Hang around. We're going to have questions. We already have a couple for you. So I would ask you to, um, to hang on. And uh, um, after our next two presenters, we'll, we'll go to the Q&A. So next up, I want to introduce and welcome uh, Anna Selden, Associate Director of Publications for Georgetown Law. Anna is the Associate Director of Publications and Faculty uh, Manuscript Services. She directs the Office, office of Journal Administration, uh, which is the office that oversees the 13 student-edited journals at Georgetown Law. Anna, uh, welcome. Thank you, and uh, take it away. Uh, Matt, thank you for the kind introduction. A little bit of background on Georgetown so you understand how we entered the picture on the accessibility and 508 questions. Uh, as you can see, Georgetown has been an innovator in the legal education since, since the late 1800s. Um, Matt mentioned we have 13 law journals. That is correct. There's 11 of them that we do production for, which is why you see that statistic there. Uh, Georgetown Law also hosts continuing legal education classes. So for those of you not familiar with the legal field, it's how lawyers keep up on changes and developments within, uh, within the legal field. We also host academic conferences, and the journals host symposia, which bring about uh, production and articles for our journals. And uh, who do we serve? So it's a good idea to understand uh, who's using our journals. We have about 2,000 students that are currently enrolled. For our journals here that we manage the subscriptions for, we have about 2,500 annual subscriptions. And in 2017, we had nearly 230 digital downloads of our articles. So to give you an idea of what that means, there's, there's a few ways that uh, the outside community can access our content. One is via paid uh, databases, Lexis and Watson, things like that. Uh, and we've worked with Synveo to get our articles up for sale as PDFs. Uh, so that's where that, that, number, that number comes from there. Uh, and then really sort of what's been driving our, our reasons for dealing with this accessibility and making sure that our, that our content is like that. As far as I know, one of the first law schools to tackle this, so we're laying the groundwork we hope for, for other institutions as they come along. And our goal is really to get our material and to get our scholarship out there. And being compliant with these new regulations is, is really one way to achieve that and to meet our, our dedication to, to the public service. And we want to make sure that any reader who finds our content useful is able to access it to its fullest capability. So that's really been one of the reasons why we've you know, been looking at this, uh, these 508 PDFs here. Um, and a little bit of background on how it came about. In 2016, they decided that they were going to upgrade the website and do a big redesign. So we worked with various vendors to try and get what we were looking for. Uh, last year, we were able to identify a vendor. We began to work with them for the redesign process. 
And at some point it became apparent that we needed to, uh, to address this accessibility issue. And it went just beyond the basic pictures need to have alternative text so a screen reader knows what it's a picture of to all the documents that you're uploading on your website need to be, need to be 508 compliant, need to meet this level of accessibility. And for us, we're dealing with really two different types of PDFs. We're dealing with the homegrown ones that start out as Word files. And the, um, the compliancy for that one is a little bit easier to manipulate it in Word and to make sure it works in PDF. The challenges that we're faced with our journal articles and that we're working with Simveo is that once we present them with a Word file, it goes through a uh, unique software process. So we're having to deal with stuff more on the, on the back end once the PDF is, is created. And the big thing with law journals and where we're, um, the, the hurdle we're really trying to cross is the footnotes. Uh, footnotes are, are readily apparent in law review articles. They are pretty much on every page. And a lot of them span uh, more than one page, which has been a challenge for screen readers. So that's one thing we've been working with Simveo to figure out is the best way, the best way to deal with that. And really, what is the assistive technologies? What are the screen readers reading? What are they picking up? How are they going through? And those are all things that we're looking at to figure out the best way to sort of attack the problem that we're presented with here. And as you see on your screen, the first one is the, the footnote as the, as the alt text. Uh, and the advantage to this way of doing it is that the reader is taken to the footnote directly after the call out in the journal article. And that, that's really the way we feel that most readers are interacting with our material. They're reading a paragraph. When they get to a footnote, they're scanning down the footnote, and then they're going back to the text. Uh, so that's, that's, one way to, um, that's one way to tackle the problem. And uh, the second one, and we're not, we're not sold on this one yet, we're still trying to figure out the logistics here, is to either be able to skip the reference entirely, and, and we're not certain if the assistive technology has reached that point yet, or to give the reader an option to read the reference when they want to. And uh, there, is, there is a certain advantage to that because it gives, the user, it gives the user control that they would have normally. So we're working with, uh, working with Symbio to figure out which is really the, which is really the best solution there. Um, and as you can see from the next slide, um, some of the sort of <laughs> findings we've come upon. One of the biggest things is we're, we're gathering, as you can see, you're just gathering feedback on the user experience. And that's really going to guide where we go from here. So if we're hearing that reading a footnote immediately after it's called in the text isn't working for those users, then we would obviously explore the second route, which is giving the user more control over that. Um, so we don't have any total answers yet, but the nice thing is we're, like I said, we're gathering a bunch of data to figure out the best way and uh, just working with Symveo to um, develop the best use of this, of this technology. And uh, just to sort of circle back really quickly, again, the challenge for us is that we're, <clears throat> whether we have these two sets of documents out there, the, the one set of PDFs that we create from Word and the ones we're dealing with are, are going through another, uh, another set of uh, computer program that I think adds a little bit of challenges to it. And uh, lastly, our, uh, what we're figuring out now, going forward, we've, we've, able, we've been able to incorporate accessibility into our current PDF. So for our current content, we're basically set on that. But I think like Matt and Rohan touched on earlier, we're trying to figure out what we're doing with our legacy content. So that's one of the, one of the big questions that we have. Um, and with that, I can turn it back over to Matt. Thanks, Anna. That was terrific. Um, I would ask you also to hold tight. Uh, we'll circle back for, with you for some Q&A shortly. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to introduce our third and final panelist, uh, Rachel Comerford, Director of Content Standards for Macmillan Learning. Rachel has over a decade of experience in the print and digital publishing world. As the Director of Content Standards at Macmillan Learning, Rachel helps to implement and maintain industry and internal standards in content, platforms, and processes. Her work includes establishing internal accessibility, metadata, and EPUB implementation guides that align with industry best practices. She co-chairs the W3C Publishing Community Group and, partic and participates in working groups at IMS Global, BISG, and AMAC to create uh, accessible products that are a joy for anyone to use. Rachel, welcome, and take it away. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so. As, as Matt introduced me, I'm the um, Director of Content Standards at Macmillan Learning. 
Um, and I'm just going to walk you through um, some of the steps that we took in order to apply accessibility in our workflows and in our content um, as we continue to produce higher education content. The first step that we took was really just trying to understand what our customer was um, and who we were trying to reach. And for us, that really broke down into two separate groups. We had our external customers, and those are the really obvious ones, right? They're the students and the instructors um, and the institutions that are looking for the, at this accessible content and that are looking for resources to help make content accessible because, as we know, um, we, we focus um, mostly on university clients. We have a, um, a high school list as well, but um, a lot of these schools aren't getting the funding that they need in order to support students, and they need to know that the materials that they're getting for classes are accessible from the beginning. Um, and we also, they also want to clear communication from us. They want to know where we are right now and where we're going. But there was a second side to that, which um, I think too often gets ignored, and that's the internal customers. Um, those were our peers and our colleagues that were actually producing content, and they were trying to understand what accessibility actually is and why it's important. Um, they wanted to learn about the industry standards and how it applied to what they specifically were doing, if they were working in design or production or editorial. Um, and they also wanted to understand what their customers were asking for and why they were asking for it. So we realized that we had two major changes that we needed to make, and one was a change to our content, and the other was a change to our culture. Um, so the first, the place I'm going to start is by talking about the changes to content that we made. Um, it was probably about five years ago that we really began this journey in earnest, um, and part of that was identifying who our customers were um, and why it was so important to us that we reach um, these students and these professors. And what we realized when we were doing our research was is that there was a really large audience that we were missing. There are about 56.7 million people, 19% of the uh, population, that self-identify as having a disability. A recent NPD study showed us that over a third of students identified themselves as having a disability that impaired their use of course materials in their standard format, and that rose to nearly half among first-year students. Um, and the unemployment rate for persons with a disability was 10.5% in 2016, which is twice that of people with no disability. And the reason that that in particular was so important to us was because we produce educational material for college students. We're supposed to be preparing students for the world outside of the university, knowing that they were stepping into that unemployment rate meant to us that we needed to do more to make sure that they were prepared. So the first thing we did was we looked at accessibility standards, um, and Rohan um, covered a little bit of this in his presentation as well. Um, there are the WCAG 2.0 standards, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Those are managed by the W3C. Uh, I provided a link in this presentation. They're um, pretty easy to find with a quick Google. Uh, those have three different levels. There's A for the sort of the basics, AA, which is what most of our customers read as a standard. And then AAA, which is a little more difficult to achieve um, and requires digging in a little bit more into the content and the platforms, but it's not impossible. Um, we set the goal internally for our platform and our content to meet WCAG 2.0 AA. We decided to embrace the EPUB standard. Uh, creating accessible PDFs is not impossible, uh, it's certainly and certainly there are a lot of customers that continue to use them. For us, we knew that the EPUB had innate accessibility features that the PDF didn't have and would likely create a much better user experience for our customers. So we really dug into that EPUB standard that's now maintained by, also by the W3C uh, and took a look at the accessibility profiles that were associated with it in order to apply those to the way that we were developing eBooks. And when we did it, what we decided was we weren't just going to do this going forward. We were going to go into our backlist and start looking at the titles that most of our students were using and making sure that we were producing the most accessible ebooks possible for those students as well. We actually remediated about 200 ebooks uh, that went from PDF to EPUB. Uh, we did establish an implementation guide, and it makes use of those industry standards uh, and also um, looks at the common features that are in our books so that there's a consistent user experience. And we built a validator so that we knew that everything that we were producing was going through an automated validation process 
and telling us that everything that we were producing had the same accessibility requirements met that we were meeting uh, for all of our other products. And then we started participating in verification and certification programs. This was important to us because it's one thing when you look at your own work and you say, I think that I've hit all the requirements here. It's another thing when you bring in a third party and they're able to tell you that this is working for you. So we um, worked with accessibility experts. We had them come in and do audits of all the uh, content and platforms that we were producing. They told us what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, and we used that in order to improve the quality of our implementation guides and our standards. Um, we also participated in a certification effort with Benetech, uh, not-for-profit. Uh, Benetech was looking at a global certified accessible program where they would um, review EPUBs and let you know where you were and weren't hitting the mark. Um, we started off with our first round of EPUBs, the first we ever produced, um, and when the reviews came back, we had 50 to 60 percent in a lot of our titles. And um, you know, given how much work we had put into the implementation guides, we were definitely disappointed, but we took that to heart, and we started to make improvements in our application of EPUB. And I was really happy to see that when our last round came back, we were actually up in the 90s. Uh, so our team has really invested themselves in understanding how to make a difference in the quality of the e-books. And it's great to hear that from a third party um, instead of just, just trying to look at it yourself. Um, we also talked about putting accessibility workflows in for all of our content. So we stopped thinking about it afterwards and started thinking about it very early on. Uh, so everything that we programmed, we programmed with accessibility in mind uh, from the beginning for all of our projects. So that included properly structured and tagged content. It included uh, accessibility metadata to let the user know where there were hazards, such as flashing, um, and also where there were resources, like alt text. And we made testing resources available to all of the content creators, as well as training resources. Um, so what we achieved this year was uh, pretty significant. We produced uh, more than 300 accessible ePubs, um, more than 12,000 closed captioned videos, uh, 500 updated interactives uh, for accessibility, 500,000 images with alt text, and more than 100 updated Word, PDF, and PowerPoint resources for instructors and students. Our next step was to start taking a look at our culture and how the internal culture, um, the people here, make as big a difference um, as the technology that we're producing. A huge part of this was training. Uh, we knew that we could point them to a URL and tell them what the standards were, but we also know that reading standards is painful, uh, trying to get through all that terminology, trying to interpret everything that's written there. It's hard to do. And so um, we wanted to make sure that they were getting resources that were meeting them at their level. And so we created training programs. There were multi-day in-person trainings with accessibility specialists um, where we focused on different um, role development, so production, editorial, developers. Uh, and gave them a chance to really dig into how accessibility was going to impact their day-to-day -day work. Uh, we gave them detailed documentation. We gave them QA checklists so that everything that they produced, they had something to look at as a resource and say, okay, uh, we know that we need to look at X, Y, and Z before we can even consider this ready for QA. Um, we offered accessibility office hours once a week. We have an accessibility specialist uh, from a third party that calls in and gives all of our employees a chance to ask any questions they have about accessibility over the course of that hour. It is always jam-packed. <laughs> uh, we provide a single location for accessibility resources and seeking accessibility help so that all of our employees know that there is one place that they can go in order to get the answers that they need. This made a huge difference in the way that our employees were approaching accessibility and how they felt about accessibility as a responsibility. We went from team members wondering why they were doing something, why it was important to them, to talking about how the training alone was a huge paradigm shift, that it was an opportunity for them to watch someone use assistive technology and to uh, understand the needs of users with disabilities. 
And for them, it made it personal. And making it personal became a huge part of the conversation that we were having. We knew that too often people were looking at the customer that was using assistive technology as someone else, as not being a part of their primary customer base. And so we made sure that they understood that these were people that they were interacting with, that they were every customer that they had. Uh, we brought in actual users of assistive technology and had them demonstrate their experiences with our products. We gave them resources like blindnewworld.org and Tommy Edison's blindfilmcritic.com um, so that there was a human face on what they were doing. And we discussed the curb cut effect, how all of our users would benefit from changes that we made, even if we were calling those changes, changes for accessibility. And the end result was that it, the users told us, or our internal users told us, it made them think a lot more about accessibility. They were going to ask a lot of questions during the development of text and ancillary products that they were going to make sure that they could do everything that, that they could to create products that worked for everyone, especially students with accessibility needs. And it was so gratifying to see this sort of response from my colleagues. And then the last thing that we did was we actively got involved in the industry. Instead of um, just doing a Google search and waiting for information to come to us, we said, we know how much this impacts our customers and we know how much this impacts our company. We need to be actively involved in the creation of these standards and actively involved in the creation of solutions. Um, and so we got involved with the W3C, which I mentioned before. They maintain the um, WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, they also have a publishing group. There's a working group, a business group, and a steering committee. And there's a community group. And the community group is actually open for anyone to join. Uh, and at the community group, we are focusing at least part of our attention, and I say this as the co-chair who is constantly recruiting for people to participate, on best practices for creating an EPUB, where the biggest challenges are in making something that works for everyone, and how you can help in order to create a better product for users. Uh, we participate in IMS Global. They have a great accessibility innovation leadership network. Uh, BISG in the content structure, content, content structure Committee and Accessibility Task Force, the BISG has worked on guides like the Quick Start to Accessible uh, Publishing, and they're actually putting out the uh, version two of this later in the spring, along with a bunch of sort of quick tips to help you get started with accessibility. Um, this is a great group to um, talk about real implementation of the work that's being done. Uh, and then, of course, CAMI, uh, which offers a series of resources. They have a task force that's working on uh, looking at accessibility and how it applies to um, sort of a quick look at the accessibility of a product. Uh, they also, out of Georgia Tech, manage Access Text Network, uh, which is a way that we actually distribute some of our uh, textbooks to students that have disabilities. Uh, and that is uh, pretty much all that I have here. Um, and uh, Matt, I'm going to hand it back to you. Terrific, Rachel. Thank you so much. That was, that was excellent. Um, folks, uh, we've got lots of questions. Um, we're going to try to get to as many of these as we can. Um, a number of our speakers, probably all of them, have shared links throughout the course of this presentation. These slides will be available to you post-event. Um, just look for an email from us. You'll be able to download them as a PDF uh, as well. So let's get into our questions. Uh, Rohan, I'm going I'm to direct the first one to you. Um, a couple of folks asked a variation to this question. Can I just cut and paste an image caption into an alt text field? <clears throat> OK. Um, can, I, can I just cut and paste uh, an image caption? Yes. In, in, into yeah. alt text, OK. Into an alt, into an alt text field. Well, right. Uh, I, I guess the answer is no. Uh, you know, an image caption is uh, is written primarily with the uh, sighted users in mind, while all text is written for users with uh, visual impairment. Um, all text includes a lot more detail about the image that is um, kind of left unstated in image captions. So. Okay. Uh, Anna and Rachel. Actually, Rachel, maybe we'll start with you here, and then Anna, feel free to weigh in. Um, 
this person asks, how are publishers tackling the work necessary to author the content in such a way that it is accessible, or to add in accessibility affordances during the editing slash copy editing, copy editing process? Uh, so I'm a big believer in taking accessibility into account from the very beginning, instead of waiting um, uh, instead of waiting to, for affordances later on in the process. And uh, it just makes things a little bit simpler and, and less expensive in terms of applying accessibility to what you're doing. Uh, communication and training is a huge part of that for us. We uh, have a, a messages that we regularly send out to our authors to let them know why we're considering accessibility as part of uh, the development process. But we also work with our designers to make sure that they understand color contrast and um, testing for colorblind users. Uh, we have conversations with editorial about um, watching out for language that points to location on the page uh, instead of referencing content. So we try to avoid saying on the upper left-hand corner of this page um, and try to talk about the actual content that's in that location instead to avoid uh, making things uh, too ableist for uh, visual users. So it, there's a huge number of uh, resources out there in terms of trying to um, sort of point users to creating more accessible content from the beginning. And a lot of it just you know, starts with tiny changes and it just starts to sort of snowball as you're producing content. Anna, do you have anything to add to that? We do, Matt, thanks. Uh, ours is a little bit different, and we're not dealing with the visual in terms of color contrast, so we have, we have a little bit different approach. Uh, there's not much we can do with the, with the footnotes on the author end. That's something we would be addressing on the back end. But what we have started doing is pushing back on our student editors, as opposed to authors, to provide alternative text for things like graphs and charts that they're running in the journal. Thankfully, there's not many, and that that's a relatively easy fix to, to handle on the front end. Great. And while I have you, Anna, uh, we have a specific question here, for, uh, question specifically for you, asking how your readers are ac accessing their content. What tools are they adding? Uh, are they are they using? And and how do you how do you uh, capture or how are you aware of what those different tools are? Sure. Sure. That's a great question. So. For the web pages, we have a mobile first priority now, uh, and the, the websites are designed to, to really be functional on a mobile device. And that's just dealing for the basic content. Uh, as far as our PDFs, we don't have specific data yet, though we'll be, we'll be seeking that out. Our assumption is that when somebody is looking at a journal article, even the length, because the short ones are 20 pages and the long ones can run 100 pages, that something like that is really being accessed on something like a laptop or, or an iPad. Great. Um, Rohan, I know you can see the questions as well. I have one here. Um, maybe you can help me with the context. But um, this, this person asks, uh, I, I assume she was advised, token alt text short, 130 characters. True or false? <clears throat> Right, so um, short short descriptions are uh, two two hundred fifty five characters uh, max. Um, that's that's the limit for short description. Um, long descriptions can can go into uh, um, you know several like long pages and and so on. But but uh, yeah, one hundred thirty characters would be false. False. Okay, great. Rachel, how do you how do you recommend handling learning activities that have sensory requirements? For example, phonics activities that are problematic in an online environment when a user is hearing impaired. Uh, so what we try to do when we're addressing activities like that is to start with a learning objective first approach. So I think one of the mistakes that we've made in the past is that we get this idea for an activity we build out the activity as we imagine it, and then we try to figure out how to make that accessible. Uh, and rather than do that, what we're doing now is we're talking at the very beginning about what the objective is, what we want the student to actually get out of that experience. And we use that to shape the experience within the activity. So if we know that the activity is relying on a particular sense, and that's a requirement, and we come across that a lot in places like psychology where you have um, uh, uh, sense perception courses, 
Um, we do try our best to provide a reasonable alternative for the student. But what we found for the most part is in a lot of these activities where we previously relied on material like that, we don't actually have to. It's that we built it that way in the beginning, and now we're trying to find a way to go back and fix it. Um, instead, we look at it from the very beginning, and we present as many solutions as we can. Um, we pick out the one that we think is best for that particular product, and we justify it. We know that it's going to work for this user, for this user, and for that user. It might be problematic for this one particular user, and what can we do in order to assist with that? But we try to stay away from those activities where it's not a requirement of the learning objective. OK. Um, that makes sense. Uh, a lot of questions in some form or another around tables. Um, specifically, this person says, I've heard conflicting information regarding tables. And Rohan, maybe you can, you can answer this one. Can you group a table and just give it a summary? Or do you need to tag the table with header rows and table cells, et cetera? <clears throat> yeah, right. Um, so, well, the, the, the good practice is, uh, is, is always the latter. Um, and that's to tag the table with the uh, header rows and, uh, and table cells. Uh, and if the, the table happens to be a complex one, then, then provide a summary. But, uh, but, but, but sure, I mean, you know, just, just grouping the table and just giving a summary does not, uh, uh, does, does not, not, not really work. OK, so um, here's a little bit more of a specific question. On a math test, if we describe an image of a graph in alt text, we've technically answered the question, how would you make the image accessible to blind students without giving away the answer? Those are always fun okay. ones. So is that, is that a question? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> uh, we hit those a lot at McMillan. Um, in uh, math, econ, science, um, so many images that we base questions on. Uh, and it is truly a challenge to write alt text that doesn't give away the answer. When we can, we make the graphs navigable by screen reader and keyboard. Uh, it's not always the easiest thing to do. And sometimes it's actually creating a more complex experience for the student. So when we realize that that's the case, we do go back and, and reconsider whether it needs to be an image with alt text. The, the difficulty there is, is that um, you really need to start rewriting your alt text based on the circumstance that the image is in. So um, rather than provide all of the information that appears in the graph, you need to um, understand what the question being asked is, and then look at the information on the graph and figure out what you can provide that will lead them to the answer without actually giving them the answer. And that's probably the most challenging alt text that you will have to write um, when you're producing a product. Like you could have incredibly complex infographics that you're trying to describe, but you know what all the elements are. It's when you know that you have to leave out a piece of information that somebody else has to try to infer that you hit the biggest challenges. Right, right. There is another well, alternative I'm, to that. Right. Um, there's another alternative to that, which is um, providing a, uh, a printable file um, that takes advantage of 3D printing um, so that the student can feel the graph um, in order to answer the question. Interesting. OK. Rohan? Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Rachel's um, uh, input. And I, I just have uh, this one thing to add that you know, anyone who's interested in looking at some good examples of how this is done, uh, we found uh, Diagram Center to be an excellent resource, and that's uh, www.diagramcenter.org. Diagramcenter.org, great, Diag excellent. And yeah, dot org. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, this one might be tough for you guys, since I'm not sure that um, any of you do this practically on a, on a, on a, in terms of your markets that you're in. But let's, let's give it a shot. This person asks, what is the best way to make chemistry content accessible? In some cases, we're talking about thousands of molecular images. Considering ChemML is not broadly used or, bro or browser capable or compatible, is it best to add alt text for each molecule? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? This is the one time I'm glad to be in the legal field because we don't touch that at all. 
<laughs> um, Ro- Ro- so Rohan, I, anything? I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rachel. Uh, um, I can take like sort of a stab at it. We do produce um, chemistry content, and I, I agree. It is probably one of the most one of one of the very difficult things that we do. Uh, we do try to keep a library of all of the alt text that we do create. The initial investment was very high. Uh, that that investment decreases since. Um, there are only so many varieties of molecules that we actually use within any given textbook. So um, what we've done is we actually archive our images with alt text embedded in the metadata so that we can pull that embedded alt text metadata anytime to reuse it for similar images, similar molecules, stuff like that. Rohan, did you want to add something there? Um, yeah, the, the, just just that um, you know, obviously, Chem ML is uh, does have problems with uh, with browsers, and um, the the recommendation from our teams is uh, is that it's best to use uh, uh, is to have all text or all tags for uh, for each image for each molecule. Is, uh, <clears throat> Great. And, so. so yes. We we are we're just we're starting to run short on time. I want to ask this final question to each of you, um, and let's go in the order that you guys spoke. So we'll start with Rohan, uh, and this is sort of a bigger picture question. But for folks who want more information and who want to help advocate um, better accessibility practices inside their own organizations, um, can you give any tips? And Rachel, you touched on this, and Annie, you may have as well uh, on on how you've developed guides or master documents internally uh, to ensure that, that your team, your colleagues, are following accessibility guidelines? And or are there other resources, maybe that haven't been mentioned over these last 45, 50 minutes, um, that can help with this? Rohan, do you want to answer that first? Um, sorry, Matt. I'm having trouble uh, finding which question you're asking. I'm, um, if you could, sorry, repeat that for me. Yeah, essentially, essentially, kind of to 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 put a button on this conversation. Any other third-party resources, websites, um, you know, places folks can look for more information on accessibility. Certainly, as they try to evangelize its importance inside and outside their own organization. Um, and then specifically, maybe for Anna and Rachel, any advice they would have for our viewers um, on how they've, they've been able to, to adopt and, and move forward um, accessibility initiatives within their organizations. Yeah, right. So, you know, um, like w3.org is, uh, is, is a fantastic uh, resource for, uh, for guidelines for the latest um, uh, you know regulations and um, you, you know it, it's it's got it's got all the all the latest information on section 508 and uh, what WCAG is doing and and stuff like that um, that's that's the one key resource we go to for um, any online tools that that um, you know we we want to use for um, testing of accessible um, um, products and um, and also following um, you, you know guidelines and regulations that uh, that keep coming up. The w3 w3.org has uh, has a wealth of information on all of these uh, subjects. Great, Anna. Anything That's to add? Me. Sure. Uh, for us, it started a number of years ago with a competition that my office runs, and so I was working closely with our disability services office to reach out and find out really the students who are accessing it, what challenges do they have and how could we meet those. And then when it grew to an overall, looking at the, the website overall, uh, our university works with a, a company called Site Improve. And they will send reports. They will basically crawl your web pages and send reports of where your accessibility issues are. And they will rank them, as I think Rachel mentioned earlier, uh, AAA, AA, and single A. And they'll let you know what those issues are. So that's that's really the best way that we um, that we attack that is looking to see you know what comes up in the site improve report that we need to fix. Right. Great. And lastly, Rachel. Uh, yeah. So I, I think industry involvement is a, a huge, huge part of that. And I know I mentioned this a little bit in my presentations, but. Um, 
when we wanted people to start understanding what we were doing and we, we wanted to understand it ourselves, we started getting involved in more and more of the industry groups and started getting involved in more and more of those conferences and presentations. So, you know, we started to attend CSUN, which is a great accessible technology conference, um, which is actually coming up. Uh, we started attending Accessing Higher Ground, which is uh, usually in November and based in Colorado. We got involved in IMS and W3C, as Rohan mentioned, um, and uh, BISG, which uh, is really like on the, on the publishing ground level, um, understanding what the content is, how we're producing it, and, and what we can do to help. And that gave me the connections to colleagues uh, outside of my own experience that started to teach me so much about what could and should be done for accessibility. It opened my eyes to an entirely different world. That makes a lot of sense. Great. Well, um, we're just about out of time, and unfortunately, there's way more questions than we could ever get answered here. However, um, if you ask the question that we didn't get to, uh, we do capture all that information. Um, one of our friends at Sinveo uh, Publisher Services, who is an accessibility expert, can reach out via email to help uh, answer some of these questions we did not get to. Um, in addition, Sanveo Publisher Service is, is, is very soon going to be publishing a free report on the topic of accessibility in publishing workflows, and everyone registered for today's webinar will receive a free copy, so be on the lookout for that. Um, on behalf of Publishing Executive and, and Book Business and Sanveo Publisher Services, I want to thank our fantastic speakers today, Rohan, Anna, Rachel, um, for your time, your contributions. I'd certainly like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar. Um, be sure to check out Book Business and Publishing Executives webinar page. We've got a lot of great web, uh, webinars archived, a number of great ones coming up. And in that vein, if you could take just a moment, the next slide will, will show you a poll, um, answer a couple questions. It helps inform decisions we make to bring uh, content to you in the future. So again, thanks everyone for participating. Uh, we hope to see you at the next Publishing Executive and Book Business webinar. Have a great day.